pickpocket. You're like, what happened? Did you give away all the money? You don't. You want to know more. And just like that, it's that aspect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put curiosity in all of us. And that's something we're all tested with. Right? Why do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say when you see somebody the first time of the opposite gender, the first look is okay. Anything after that is wrong. Because curiosity makes you want to look again. Well, I haven't seen exactly what does her eyes look like, what do his nose look like. You know, curiosity pushes you to the next point. Thirdly, Curiosity is something. When somebody says, oh, you know I talked to so-and-so, if you're talking on the phone, and somebody says, oh, if you don't have to so-and-so, you don't know what happened, I'm all joy, but it's nothing, nothing. Your curiosity wants you to know to push that viva to the next level. And so curiosity is something also that we're all afflicted, we are all tested with. And the other thing that we are all tested with is anger. Every single one of us has a boiling point. Every single one has a point at which we crack. For some people it's higher and for some people it's lower. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this also along with these other tests in every single one of us. So you know you'll be tested with money, you'll be tested with your family, you'll be tested with your health, you'll be tested with the desires of the world, you'll be tested with the want to know, and you'll be tested with anger. And it's a test for everybody, the proof of that is, if you think about Iman, right? Iman is an interesting thing that we have in Islam. In Islam, it's exclusive, Iman, the concept of Iman is exclusive to Muslims. And that is the ability to measure the actual relationship that you have with God. Is how you measure the relationship that you have with God. A lot of faiths and way of life don't actually have this measurable way. Islam is the only religion that comes out and says you can actually measure the strength of your relationship with God. Does my Wi-Fi have three bars or four bars? How close am I at with God? Interestingly, right? SubhanAllah, we Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. And I'll give you an example of that. When you hear Quran and it doesn't affect you, then you know there's an issue with your heart. But when you commit a sin and it's almost normal to you to commit sin, there's something wrong with your heart. Again, the same application that you can tell that something is wrong with the state of your iman, the state of your relationship with God. And one example of that is nowadays when we look at what's going on in Syria, when we look at what's going on in Burma, when we look at what's going on in Afghanistan, in all these places of the world. Some of us, we receive these uh, WhatsApp videos and stuff like that. And we just look at it and we go, oh, that's really sad. And we move on with our day. How many of us are actually crying? How many of us are actually worrying about these people and genuinely caring about them? And sad enough, I see this trend of a lot of people who have left these countries. You know, they have family here, but it doesn't affect them anymore. Because now you're in that state of that I'm safe, I'm happy, it shouldn't affect me that much. And this is the state of our iman, is that, yes, you know, it should affect us, but we kind of keep, get desensitized these things. The more we see them, the more we're like, oh, this is their situation, not our situation. And this is a, a, an issue with our iman, with our hearts. So, I'm not saying every time you see these, you know, these pictures and stuff, you should be to start crying. What I'm saying is there should be some uh, uh, affection or some issue uh, in your heart when you see these things. And this is a, a form of a weakness of Iman when you see somebody in pain and you just look at it like it doesn't affect you. Or when you go to the hospital and when you drive by a graveyard, you should have some sense of like, SubhanAllah, look at these people, I don't want to be in the state, or may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect me from the state. Even sometimes when you're driving by an accident and you see an accident and you see the like, ambulance going, your curiosity keeps in, I want to see what happens. We don't want to go to accidents where there's no real damage, right? We want to go to accidents where it's bad. Because that's your curiosity. And in a sense, we should be going there and saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect these people. I hope nothing happens. And what happens is after a while is your heart starts becoming, uh, becoming harder. You start getting desensitized. And this is how you can measure the, the, the closeness or the strength of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with God. We said this is something... Uh, very unique to Islam. So imagine the strongest relationship with God. The strongest, like four bars, 6G connection. Right? The Prophet said the strongest connection, the strongest form of Iman was the Imam of, of, the Imam of Abu Bakr. Where Abu Bakr had the closest relationship with God. A relationship beyond strength that many you can imagine. Right? We pray in the Masjid al Isha and we think that we've accomplished something really big. But Abu Bakr was doing millions of things for the Ummah. Right? So he has the strongest relationship with God. 
And Abu Bakr radiallahu anh is this, you know, we look at his iman and go, subhanAllah, the best friend of the Prophet. Constantly with the Prophet. So he has this immense strength in the level of his iman. So we look at Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, what is Abu Bakr radiallahu anh faced with? Anger issues. Even Abu Bakr radiallahu anh struggled with this. The Sahabas knew that Abu Bakr radiallahu anh had anger issues. They knew that he had a temper. And they adjusted themselves accordingly around him. They didn't, you know, uh, they knew that, okay, subhanAllah, Abu Bakr has anger issues. Let's not say something that will make him upset. Or let's not do something to upset him. But they also loved him because they understood him. And they knew that this was a part of his character. And they accepted it. But the strength of Abu Bakr Allah, is in the ability that he had to control his anger. In the ability he had to control his emotions. And the ability he had to control what came out of his mouth. And this is where 99% of the people who struggle with this fail. And remember, I'm talking about me and you who have the ability to control their anger. This is proven. You have the ability to control your emotions, what comes out of your mouth. And the proof of that, of that can be found in the Quran. Look, in order for you to understand why you're affected, what leads you to lose your cool on your children, on your husband, on your wife? What leads you to that state of not being able to control yourself where you, you punch or you yell or you swear or you're just straight up depressed or sad about your situation where you end up having self-harm? Like for example, boys will punch, girls will cut. Where does that come from? How does it lead you to that area? How did you get there? And that's because you're not able to control your emotions. And when you understand that you have the ability to control them, then you will control them. So, we have to look at the proof that we have to control our emotions. Or the proof that we have to control the ability of what we say and how we feel. And where we can find that is in the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an, uh, that basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you recite the Qur'an, first of all, seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. Now we have to understand Shaytan because Shaytan is the one that kind of uh, is responsible, a lot of people would say, for our anger. A lot of people have this notion that Shaytan is the one that makes us angry. Now you have to understand Shaytan uh, because you have to know your enemy. Before you're going to battle, before you're going to any type of contest or anything, you have to know what you're up against. So who is Shaytan and what is Shaytan's, some people would say, ability. I don't like to say Shaytan's powers. Because the minute you say Shaytan's powers, you're giving power to somebody that doesn't have any power. All power belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaytan is powerless, right? Shaytan just has what? He has a skill set. Shaytan has the skills to do certain things. What is the skill that Shaytan has? The only thing Shaytan can do is Shaytan can whisper. Other than that, you are in full control. Shaitan, the only skill he has, and we don't even want to use the power he has, is he has the ability to whisper. The wasmas of the shaitan, the ability to kind of plant the seed. And this is something that shaitan takes pride in. In the Quran, shaitan talks about, in the Quran you find the speech that shaitan gives. Where is he giving the speech? Shaitan is giving the speech in Jahannam. So if you write speech of shaitan in Google, or you open the Quran, you'll find the speech. It's an actual speech that shaitan has given. And what shaitan says is, look, he's in Jahannam now with the people of Jahannam, and he's giving this lecture to them. And he's telling them, look, why are you mad at me? Why are you upset with me? I didn't do anything. And shaitan says this, he says, I didn't make you do anything. And that's what you have to understand. Shaitan at that point is saying, look, I didn't do anything. All I did was I whispered to you. All I did was I told you what to do. I didn't make you do it. You did it yourself. And then he says, who am I? Why would you follow me? Didn't you know that Allah and the Prophet are the truth? All I did was tell you, and you screwed up and you followed me. Then Shaitan says, look, I'm here with you. I can't even help you. You think I can help you? And, and then Shaitan says, Welcome to Hellfire, basically. He says, We're all in this together. We all messed up. You screwed up. I didn't do anything. I didn't force you to do anything. So he himself is dis distancing himself from bringing you into this. 
So you can't say, well, I get angry because she bond me. No, you did it yourself. Then we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, to prove that you have full control over yourself. Allah says in the Quran, indeed, He's talking about shaitan. Indeed, shaitan has no authority over those who believe and rely upon their Lord. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very interesting. He said His authority is only over those who take an ally with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning me and you who have thee, who have Islam, who have Islam in our lives, cannot be moved by shaitan. If what? If our Islam, if the connection that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our iman is strong. If your iman is not strong, you can be afflicted by shaitan. Now what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is, look, He cannot dictate for you what to do. We said, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the same thing that shaitan said. That He has no power over you. Meaning that we can establish with this little bit that you have full control over yourself. Everybody who's an adult has full control over what they say. If they don't have a clinical mental health issue, you are responsible for what you say. You will be held accountable for what you say, for what you do, how you act, when you lose your anger. Now, the question comes into place is, what do you do to not lose your anger? And how do you get in that state where anger doesn't become an issue? So, we have to first look at the Prophet's life and how he dealt with the situation. Because this is one aspect of to help. The Prophet was described as somebody who was prepared. And I would think that, what does this mean, somebody who was prepared? What do you mean by somebody who was prepared? The Prophet was prepared for every single situation. And what that means is, he was conditioned. The Prophet was red. His face is turning red, and he looked like they are going to hit each other. And the Prophet he looks at the Sahabas and he says something. He says, look, I can tell you something right now that if they say, they will change their state. Meaning they will not be upset anymore. And anytime we hear this in, in, in the Hadith or in the Quran, where there's some advice being given by the Prophet or by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very important that we learn to listen. Because this advice is golden advice. This advice is the advice that will allow us to get to Jannah or allow us to solve the problems that we have. The Prophet says this and the Sahabas immediately they spring into action. And they say, what? What is that magical, I don't want to say magical, but what is that word that's like us, you know, that will solve this issue and calm them down? And interestingly enough, these two men are arguing over money. Because money is something very personal to us, right? Money is something very personal to us. And it leads to a lot of issues in families. Finances and property and wealth lead to a lot of issues in families. So the Sahabas, they ask, what is it that you can say that can calm them down completely? And the Prophet he says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ I seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. Right? So the Sahabas, they are automatically drawn to this. Now, what we're going to dissect is, why does Allah Bilal and Shaitan Rajim not work for me? So people say, Allah Bilal and Shaitan Rajim does not work for me. Why is it not working for you? That's what we're going to talk about. But also, what are some other strategies that we can take from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that we can affect, that we can input in our life at times when we get angry? The second thing the Prophet ﷺ says is, if you're standing up and you're arguing with somebody, sit down. And if you're sitting down, lay down. Or if you're in an area where you know it's going to get bad, walk away. We know in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that when you're faced by the people of, of, of anger, or you're faced by the people that are harming you, the people that are saying things to you, just reply with salam and walk away from them. Don't engage them. Right? Leaving the situation. 
Because what we learn now in modern times is if somebody's angry at you, you leave the situation. You walk away from the situation. And the Quran is telling us this, Prophet is telling us this 1400 years ago. Walk away from the situation. Just say, you know what, peace be upon you. It's all good. You walk away from the situation. You deal with it in a way where you don't engage. And you sit down and you stand up. Then the Prophet says, make wudu. Why make wudu? Because you know some people say that water, water is, it, it calms your nerves. It also brings your blood pressure down. But there's a deeper meaning to this. The Prophet said that water is the opposite of shaitan because shaitan is made from fire. Water extinguishes flame, meaning it's a physical and a spiritual cleansing. So make wudu. You know, no matter how angry you are, you're in this mood of excessive anger. And someone says, say, Aul Billahi Rashid Shaitan Rajeem. And you say, Aul Billahi Rashid Shaitan Rajeem. And nothing happens to you. And then the person says, sit down. And you think, I gotta sit down. And you sit down. And nothing happens to you. And then you go and you make wudu. And wudu puts you in this psychological mode. Where it kind of reminds you, like, calms you down. The water calms you down. Then that should kind of fix you further. Now, if that doesn't leave, now we have to look into why. There's two stories that come, well three stories. Once the Prophet is sitting there, and a man comes to him, and the man says this Sahaba, and he says, advise me, give me some advice. And the Prophet looks at this man, and the Prophet has one thing that the Prophet has the ability of doing, is when he gives advice, it's pertinent to that person. It's relative to that person. If a person says, come and advise me, and the Prophet knows that this person struggles with prayer, the Prophet gives him advice on prayer. When a Sahaba comes and asks him, give me advice, and the Prophet knows he's struggling with finding a spouse, the Prophet gives him advice on that. So this man comes to the Prophet and he says, give me some advice. And the Prophet tells him, don't be angry. Then the Sahaba he asks again, give me some more advice. And the Prophet says, don't be angry. And the man asks again. And the third time, the Prophet says, don't be angry. And in this hadith, there's actually an interesting thing. And I read this hadith a couple of times and I said, why did the Prophet continuously tell this person, don't be angry? And the man asked again and again and again. It's because the hadith in itself has some beauty to it. And the beauty to that, aside from the Prophet saying, don't be angry, is when you ask somebody something, hey, what do you want to eat today? Or they say, I want pizza. And the person asks, what do you want to eat today? And they say, I want pizza. What do you want to eat today? It'll make the person angry. In itself, it makes the person angry. I keep asking you the same question, and you keep responding with the same answer. There's some, subhanAllah, beauty to this hadith, where the man asks a number of times, and the Prophet sort of responds with the same thing. Don't be angry. Meaning that maybe in the process, the question will continuously make the man angry. No, tell me something, don't be angry. Tell me something, don't be angry. Tell me, he's looking for something else and he's getting upset. And the Prophet is the same, the same advice from the start. So, the Prophet is, <laughs> this hadith that I'm going to tell you now comes after this hadith that I'm going to tell you. In this hadith, at the time of the Prophet, a man walks into the masjid. You've all heard this, a bedroom walks into the masjid and he urinates in the masjid. And as he's urinating, the Sahabas, they start to get agitated, they're getting upset. They're like, let's fix this man, how is he urinating in the masjid? And the Sahabas, they begin to say, let me fix him, let me deal with him. And as the Sahabas get up, the Prophet says, no, 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 let the man finish. Let the man finish his urinating, because if you interrupt him in the middle, he's going to feel pain, let him finish. And when he's done, then we approach him. And you know from this hadith, there's one valuable lesson that's being learned by everybody. The Prophet is teaching the Sahabas not to take out their anger. A. Right? Don't be upset. A man is doing something wrong, it's okay. Let him complete what he's doing, then you approach him. Also, don't approach, approach somebody when they're, they're not in the right state of mind. They're, they're, you know, the man wants to uh, uh, alleviate himself. And you know, you're giving him advice at that point, or you're approaching him with anger. Let him finish, and when he's in a state of mind, then talk. The third advice is hikmah for us all, to see that when the Prophet ﷺ approached, how did he approach? 
with love. Right? Now the second hadith comes after this hadith. And this is the hadith when the Prophet is in Medina. And a man comes up to the Prophet And in this time, the Prophet is with who? With his habas again. In the first hadith, what happened? The Prophet gave some advice to his habas, don't attack this man. He's urinating in the masjid, the Prophet says, no, let him finish. In the second hadith, this man comes up to the Prophet Again, he's with who? His habas. Now they took the advice from the first hadith. What happens? A man comes up to Rasulullah and he grabs the Prophet by his collar. And he pulls it really tight to the point where the Prophet begins to turn red. And the Sahabas are with the Prophet. The first time, the Sahabas were ready to inflict harm on this man who's urinating in the masjid. The second time, they're physically hurting the Prophet. The Sahabas don't move. They learn from the first case scenario. When the Prophet said, let me deal with it, I know what I'm doing. I can handle the situation. I don't need your help. I know I'm being choked, but don't worry, let me deal with it. And the Sahabas, they learn from the Prophet they trust that he knows how to deal with the situation of anger. What does the Prophet do? The man grabs him and he says, give me your money. He says, give me all the money that Allah has given you in the Bayt al-Mah. The Prophet does he hit the man? How does the, the, how does the Prophet retaliate? How does the Prophet uh, return from this situation? The Prophet he does something very interesting. Something very contrary to something I've ever learned. The Prophet looks at the man and he smiles. Then the Prophet asks the Sahabas, go and get some money from the Bayt al so from the that we have from the, the money that we have and give him some money. You know, when I first heard this hadith, it was contrary to everything I've heard, I've heard in life. Because what I always heard is when somebody's angry with you, don't give in. Return with a force. You can't talk to me like that. Don't. That doesn't mean if somebody's robbing you, you say, okay, you're going to take my money. But what the Prophet is saying is the Prophet was very analytical of the situation. He knew how to act. So the Prophet smiles. And the Prophet asked the Sahabas, take some money and give it to this man. And then the Prophet explains to him, you know, what you did was wrong, and the Prophet talks to him. And in both case scenarios, the person accepts Islam. The Bedouins, they take Islam. Now, what more advice do you give to somebody? You know, if somebody, a family member is upset with you, and you know, you deal with them with patience and love, you think, you know, they, you know when they're not Muslim, imagine somebody who's not Muslim becomes Muslim over this. So imagine if we do it the correct way, you can actually help the person. You can actually fix the situation that's at hand. And the Prophet Sallallahu explains to the person, and the person accepts the stuff. Now, look at how we deal with the situations that we're put into deal with. How we deal with the people that we love. How we deal with the people that we call family, or our friends. Right? A lot of us don't deal with these because what happens is that the difference between the Prophet and the Sahabas in the second hadith and the first hadith is this. They were prepared. When you prepare your heart, and I, I, I say this often, when your heart is prepared, any situation that arises, any situation, a family issue, a death, disease, cancer, Anything that comes your way and you're prepared, you will deal with it correctly. I'll give you this example. Just recently, one of my students who, I've been, who I was teaching for years, 26 years old, young brother, uh, up and running, healthy, no problems in life. He's at work, collapses and falls. He ends up finding out that he has leukemia, blood cancer, and he's in the hospital. 26 year old, healthy. And I went to go see him and I asked him, you know, How's everything? How's your life going? And he goes, you know, before I was afflicted with this, I never prayed for three years. When I was in the hospital, some brothers came and, you know, they reminded me to pray and I prayed with them. And I prayed. And before I got the diagnosis for cancer, I was thinking about what's going to happen. I'm 26, I'm not married, I'm young, I want to have a life. You know, I'm going through so much. And he started to think like, I was not prepared. I had no idea what I was getting into. 
And he said, after I prayed, and then after I visited him, I sat and I talked with him for two or three hours, and I gave him some advice. And he said, all of a sudden, man, I'm prepared for the challenge. I'm positive. I'm ready to go into, you know, my therapy. I'm ready to face this battle of blood cancer. And to the point where his, the blood cancer cell, his cell count had gone so low, his brain had begun to bleed. But when he realized that he has a lot on his side, he knew that he's immediately, within that minute, within that hour of talking, he was like, you know what, i got to condition myself. I have to prepare myself. I have to be ready. And we started talking about all the lessons we talked about five, ten years ago when he was my student. And we started to bring all those things back. And he started to say, yeah, you're right, i got to condition myself for this challenge that starts tomorrow. This is a day before he's going into chemotherapy. He starts chemotherapy the next morning, and he's hopeless, and he's lost. And we sit down, and we have this three-hour discussion. And he goes, you know what? Everything's coming back to me. And now I'm preparing myself for this challenge. Within three hours, the next morning, he got from our hospital that we were at, the other hospital that he went to, and he began his radiation therapy. Within three hours, he was ability, able to go from, I don't know what's going to happen with my life, I'm completely lost, and I'm scared that I'm going to die. And I don't know anything, and how am I going to face God, to, you know what, I'm ready for this. Within three hours, what are your challenges? What are I mean, your challenges in life? Some of us don't even have to this extent. Some may have massive challenges. I'm not, don't get it wrong. And Allah will not test you with anything that you can't burn. But can there be a bigger challenge than this? You yourself. You may have some challenges with your children that you're facing. But for somebody to be prepared, that's the trick. The Prophet ﷺ was prepared because he was conditioned. And this man, this young guy, 26 years old, we conditioned him because we didn't have time. We had, you know, three, four hours to condition him for his chemo starting the next day. We got to get him prepped. We got to get him ready for the challenge. I have to, my three hours was trying to get him in the state of mind of positivity, of having the, the, uh, the awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his life. And alhamdulillah, we successfully did that. And we text, you know, we're talking back and forth, making sure that he's going through with this therapy with positivity. Why? Because he's aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you can become aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you condition yourself. Why? When the situation arises, when you're going to lose your cool, when you have the ability to lose your cool. See, this is something you need to realize is the ability to lose your cool. This is something very important. It's not a matter of when. It's a matter of when you're able to. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he talks about this. There's a difference, right? Everybody is not an angry person. You don't see somebody who's angry, you say, oh, this is an angry person. It's somebody that gets angry. The more you label yourself, oh man, I'm very depressed, you will become a depressed person. You say, I'm somebody that has an aspect, the symptoms of depression in my life. I'm not a depressed person. I'm a happy person. I'm not an angry person. I get angry. Control the emotions. That's something that they teach you. Right? It's something to control. And it's controllable. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, whenever anger, whoever is able to control your anger, and the hadith also says, he has the means to act on it. Meaning that in that split second, when your spouse gets you worked up, when the traffic gets you worked up, when you are about to swear, and you're about to say all those beautiful words, those colorful words, and you're about to say, ah, oh, mm, this, mm, my life, mm, why is this happening to me? Ah, oh, I can't stand my spells, they're so, mm. Or your children, like, ah, oh, go to hell, kids. When you start to curse, you're at that point of breaking down, I've had it. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this hadith. He says, whoever has the ability to control, at the time when he has the means to act on it, your wife says something to you, you can say something back. Your husband says something to you, you can say something back. And what do you want to say? It's not so they change, you want to hurt them. This is the dangerous thing. When someone angers you, and they're talking about you, and they say something that really hurts you, it makes you angry, you want to retaliate with something that's going to hurt them. You know when someone's yelling at you and saying, oh you're like this, you're like that, you want to say something like, your face is like that. Oh you're ugly. Oh, you're not. Oh, but you know what? You're like this. It's not, it's not the time to be constructive. 
right? Well, I actually think, you know, the state of your anger is like, no, 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 you're saying something to hurt them. And what happens in this state is, Allah said in this hadith, this is the time that defines you. What you do in this second defines you. What you do when you're about to lose it defines you. And this is when this hadith is applicable. What is the reward for taking control of your emotions? That's what you have to learn. The reward is the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever controls his anger at the time when he has the ability to act on it. And remember, Islam being a religion that is fundamentally, all Islam focuses on is caring about other people. If you dissect Islam, if we bought Islam down here and we chopped it piece by piece, hadith by hadith, it's all about how you treat other people. Even yourself. Why do you pray? You pray five times a day, not only for you, but for the ummah. When you give zakat, it's for other people. 2.5%. Islam is the only religion that formalizes how much you can give. Hajj, when you go and you wear a white piece of cloth and you're sacrificing, you're standing with millions of other people. Fasting in Ramadan, sacrificing food to humiliate yourself. Not eating to feel as the poor feel. Encourage La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Denying anybody to act on worship and spreading this message of La ilaha illallah. All the fundamental five pillars are communal in some way. All the fundamental five pillars are about benefiting somebody else. So when you dissect Islam, it's about helping other people. So in this moment, when you can oppress somebody and hurt somebody, be it a family member, be it a friend, be it somebody that cuts you off on the road, and you control yourself in this second, this is the second that defines you. This is the second that Allah wants to know what you're going to do. Because he set you up for that second. It wasn't accidental that your children got crazy and made you upset. It wasn't accidental that your husband and wife, you know, kept putting water on the toilet seat and then you're like, ah! Oh. Allah set you up for the second. And this second defines you. What is the reward for controlling yourself in this second? Person cuts you off, you could give them the finger and you're like, ah! Oh, and you don't. And the second where you can say something back, you can swear at somebody. And you don't. So this second, you're being built up for that second. The reward is, when you control your anger, when you're not going to oppress somebody back, Allah says, on the day of judgment, I will call you personally. Sarah, Muhammad, Hamza, Yusuf, Maria, whatever your name is, Allah is going to call you and say, remember that time when you didn't retaliate. You may have forgotten it. Remember that time when you didn't say something back. Remember that time where you controlled yourself despite the sadness in your life, despite the anger in your life, despite what your children have put you through, despite the treatment of your husband towards you or your wife towards you, despite the abuse you went to, despite the breakup of not finding love, despite not being able to get married, despite your physical illness, despite your addiction, addiction despite whatever is happening in your life, Maryam Yusuf, Muhammad Sada, Allah calls you and says, you have been forgiven. On that day, Allah will forgive you. Because life is a test. And what you're building up for is those moments. Those moments when you can hurt someone. Those moments when you can retaliate. Those moments when you have the ability to lose control. And it's the same thing with sinning. The same approach can be applied with sins. When you're tempted and you're about to commit the sin, all the, the desires are built up and it's the moment I go look at that website, or I talk to this person, or I do this addiction, or I smoke this shisha, or I smoke this cigarette, or I do this, or I do that, or I message that boy, I message that girl, I don't pray. For that moment, life is a test to build you up for those moments where you have to apply it. And those moments, Allah said, A, it's you that's in control. B, Shaitan is not there. He's just cheering you on. Ah, do this bad. He's just whispering. And you have to prepare yourself for those moments. And the way you prepare yourself for those moments is by building your iman, your strength in God. And when you're God conscious, when you're God conscious, no test, Wallahi, no test. Like this boy with cancer, no test, nothing 
Nothing can push you over the limit. Because what happens in this game is you go, Alhamdulillah, I have God. You have to learn to have an understanding that God is there. Because when the test comes, and it will, I guarantee it will. Because the mercy of Allah is He's told you what the tests are going to be. This is something unbelievable. This is the biggest mercy. You know how you're going to be tested. And now it's the time, the moments that define you. Control. The more you pray, the more you learn Quran. And you know what's funny thing is, when I say these things, people say, I already know this. But the difference is applying it in your life. And I don't know if you were at my khutbah, but I gave this easy tool to create the relationship with the Qur'an. It's a very simple tool. I think everybody should do it. Once a week or once a month, wherever you go, take your phone or take the internet and research. Choose one word that matters to you. Something very simple. When I came into Vancouver, I saw the mountains. And I said, SubhanAllah, these mountains are unbelievable. Google Qur'an and mountains or hadith and mountains. You find one small hadith, or one small verse of the Qur'an. Okay? It could be with anything. There's something called the Qur'an index. And it has hundreds of topics you can find in the Qur'an. Imagine now this week, you're having a week of sadness. Or you heard about someone like my friend who's gone through sickness. And that scares you. Research Qur'an and hadith. Or uh, Qur'an and sickness. And you'll find one verse in the Qur'an. And it's usually a positive verse. Or it's a, it's a verse that's talking about something and then Allah explains. So Allah talks about, for example, when you're driving the mountains, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the birds and the way Allah provides for the birds. And you go, subhanAllah, and you write that verse down. Once a month or once a week. And you reflect on that verse throughout the week, throughout the month. Every time you see some, you know, some animals or some na na nature, you go, subhanAllah, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides for these birds. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the, the, the water with the depth and all the animals that are, then you start reflecting on the Quran and Hadith. And this is how you build a relationship with the Quran. A lot of people, when they say, I want to study Quran, they start looking, picking up books of tafsir and they say, read it for a week and then they don't read it again. Just like when Ramadan comes along, everybody goes, okay, now I'm going to finish the Quran this month. The first few days they go hard, the fifth or sixth day they go hard. Build a relationship. Right? Reflect on it with the dub or with, with, you know, application. You know, the best thing you can do for yourself is pace yourself in your religion. Pace yourself slowly in your religion, in your faith. Because faith is a build up. It's preparing you for these situations of sadness, of depression, of anger, of illness, of financial issues, of family issues. Because if you look at your problems, they fall under these areas. These four or five areas, every problem stems from them. You know, everybody generally has these same issues. So you need to understand that if you create a stronger relationship with God, and a genuinely strong relationship with God, and you exercise these basic things that we talked about when it comes to dealing with these Aggressive, aggressive situations. Look, these things will happen. And look at how the Prophet has dealt with them. Always with love. It's very, very simple. Because it's easy to talk about. Like you mean telling you these things, it sounds oh, it's very simple. But and in that state, I can't control myself. No, you can control yourself. Because Allah is saying you're in full control. We diagnose by saying if it's not a mental health issue, you are in full control. Just like you're in control of what you do. It's the same sequence that applies. So, I believe that building that relationship. And I also talked in my book, uh, also, in the that we're going to talk about it again right now, is the human, the, the way the process of that outline to soften the heart, to make it prepared, and to make it prepared for any situation, is to become social. This is something very, very important. Islam is a very social religion. Islam is a very communal religion. If you disconnect yourself from the masjid, and I hear a lot of people say things like that, well, nothing's happening in the masjid. You know, nothing's happening in this community. You can't disconnect yourself from other people who are in the community. 
Even if it's five people, even if coming to this talk, I was thinking, SubhanAllah, I hope somebody shows up, right? And then you guys showed up. But the fact that we're all here, we're in this together. When we pray, we pray together. When we fast in Ramadan, we come together in the message and we pray that all week. When we go for Hajj and Umrah, we go in groups. When we pray in Eid prayer, it's one large gathering. Right? When we give zakat, it's four other people. And Allah encourages us five times a day in the message. And when we are put into hellfire and heaven, we're taken in groups. Allah will put groups in heaven and groups in hellfire. Islam is a very social religion. Islam is a very communal religion. Don't leave yourself from your community. Wallahi. This is how your iman is slaughtered. If you want to slaughter your relationship with God, if you want to slaughter your relationship, if you want to be a weak Muslim, separate yourself from the community. Why? Because when you meet other people who are struggling just like you, it'll elevate you. It'll elevate you. It will push you. Automatically. When you see other Muslims, it elevates you. When you see somebody else wearing hijab, you're driving outside, you're in a city where there's not that many Muslims. And you see one more person wearing hijab, you see, in your heart you're like, how you? Or you see somebody with a beard. Or you see somebody with a kufi. Right? When you see other people going through the same struggle as you, it pushes me. You know, when brothers and sisters are doing programs, when I walked in here today, I see a group of sisters sitting here. And they're having some workshop or some or something. And I thought to myself, this is the most beautiful thing on earth. There is nothing more beautiful than this. There isn't. You cannot tell me, you cannot show me anything, anything in the world more beautiful than this. This is more beautiful to Allah than anything. Imagine, let me tell you how beautiful it is to Allah. Allah said, when people get together to benefit each other, it's more love to Allah than one month in Masjid al Nabawi. In the house of the, of the in the in the house of the Prophet sallallahu where the Prophet is buried, one month in full uh, seclusion, worshiping Allah. When Muslims get together and they help each other and they talk about Islam and their problems, it's more beautiful to Allah. Allah loves those people more than if you spend one month worshiping Allah in Masjid that will be locked up. There is nothing more beautiful than a communal community coming together to get together and talking about God. What we're doing here today, you know what's happening on the outskirts? Angels are surrounding us. Angels are surrounding us. Why? Because we motivate each other. We meet each other and go, what are you going through? I'm going through this. Ah, somebody else is here praying. Somebody else is in the masjid worshiping Allah also. I'm not alone. Then your problem, you start getting support. This is the key to eliminating your sadness in your life. You know, sadness comes from loneliness. Sadness and depression come from not having other people. You know, seeing us all here today motivates us to get better, to build a better standard of excellence for ourselves. And that's one thing you should do in your life, is have a standard of excellence. This is something that's extremely, extremely important. If I can give you this one advice, and you take it home with you today, is design your life. Design your life to have a standard of excellence. Everybody that I allow in my life serves a purpose. Well, why you do this? Do this with your life. Everybody in your life should serve a purpose. Your friends. If your friends are not bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and God, they don't serve a purpose in your life. You know, there's millions of good people out there. Some people say, this, well, I have a friend who's a really good person. There's tons of good people out there. Good people, who cares? There's millions of good people out there. If they're not bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're not good enough. Create the standard for yourself. Anybody that comes into my personal life, I have this thing. How are they getting me closer to Jannah? And it's selfish. People say, that's very selfish. Yes, it's selfish. I'm nice to everybody that I meet. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not going to take my time out to meet somebody out of my way if I can't figure out how are they going to serve a purpose in me getting closer to Jannah? How are we going to work together to get closer to Jannah? Because in the end of the day, you have limited time. And you have to build this personal standard of excellence for yourself. Who would you let into your heart? This is your heart. It's very expensive real estate. Don't let everybody come in and bring garbage into your heart. Allow people that come in there that serve a purpose. That fulfill your heart with love. 
with peace, with tranquility. That's why the Prophet said the hadith that he did. If you hang around with the people that are like working in the blacksmith, you know, he's working with coal, you're going to smell like that. If, if you hang around with the person that smells like incense and oud, you will smell like that. Surround yourself with the right people. You know, successful millionaires say this. If you want to become wealthy, surround yourself with people that have businesses because they'll motivate you. Set a personal standard of excellence. People that are moving forward. People that know how to prepare you to be closer to God. So when the situations come, you're prepared. And evaluate your life continuously. Where am I lacking? Why am I getting angry? Why do I lose my goal? Why do I get upset? And communicate. In one of my workshops when I talk about marriage, I, I, I work with this basic factor. It's called CAT. C-A-T. Like meow meow cat. Just like that. CAT. Communication, appreciation, and trust. Three fundamental principles that every relationship is based on. Friendship, marriage, work, anything is based on communication, appreciation, and trust. And the most uh, important out of the three is communication. One reason why we have issues in our families, one reason why we have issues with our children, one reason why we have issues in our marriages, one reason why we lose our pools is because we don't communicate. We don't tell each other. It's not of our culture to communicate. Sit down with your spouse. Sit down with your parents. Sit down with your children. No matter how weird it is. And say something like this. Do you know when you get upset? Or when you say something like that? Or when I'm upset? And you say something, it makes me feel like this. I feel like this when I get upset. Build that communication. We find it weird. Believe me, I have to go through it. I have to sit down with my father, who's 60 years old, who's, you know... You're born and raised in Pakistan, and then bring him here and have him sit down. Dad, you know how you make me feel when you get me upset? And he's like, what? He's like, why do you have to say that to my father? My father would slap you across my face. Why? Because we don't communicate. It's key. It's key. And when you tell your parents and your spouses, you prepare yourself for the situation. I sit down with your wife and be like, you know what? You know, sometimes, when yes, I do mess up and I don't, I, I don't put my clothes where they're supposed to go. I put them on the floor sometimes. And I know you get upset about that. But then when you, ta when you attack me personally, saying that I'm a dirty person, it's like all my experience, eh? <laughs> that I'm a dirty person, that that hurts me. And then, you know, your wife's going to go, you know what, you're right. I shouldn't attack you personally. I should remind you of a kind way. And maybe next time she'll do the same thing again. And then you remind her again. And when you communi communicate each other's feelings, then eventually you get it right. You mess up, again you communicate. You mess up, you get again you communicate. And that's how you build these things. There's no, nothing I can tell you that's gonna fix it magically. Like brother, you know what? Take a piece of paper, write this dua on it, put it in your hummus and eat it. And then after that, your anger is gonna go away. Or after that, you'll be able to deal with the situation. It doesn't work like that. Islam is a learning experience. Islam is made for you to mess up. It's okay to mess up. This is something that was very difficult for me to uh, accept. Because I always had the standard that I have to be this Muslim. I can't miss prayers. There's nothing wrong with missing prayers. There's nothing wrong with getting angry sometimes. There's nothing wrong with getting upset sometimes. But don't let that dictate your life. I miss the heart, it's okay, I'll miss us. I got angry once, that's it, I can't control my anger. I cut myself once, that's it, I'm a person that cut. I punched the wall once, I'm angry. Don't let that dictate you. Take control of yourself. MashaAllah, Don't let those things dictate your life. Well, Lahi, it's very simple before I wrap up, I know it's time for another Nesha. Uh, but I always say this, and it's something I love to say Islam is a diet. Islam is a diet. If you make it tangible and realistic, you will follow it. The minute you don't, you can't follow it. If you put unrealistic expectations on yourself for Islam, you won't be able to do it. Remember this, I always say this every single time. Because if you make Islam this impossible task, that oh, I have to 
to pray five times a day. Right away. Right now you don't pray at all. I have to pray five times a day. Right now you don't wear hijab. I have to wear hijab from this moment. Right now you don't have a beard. I have to grow my beard from this moment. Right now you don't do this. I have to change. You are going to do it only for two, three, four, five days. And then after that you're going to be like, oh. Gradually transition into this full concept of Islam. If you're not wearing hijab right now, start by looser full. If you don't have a beard right now, start by growing a little bit. If you're not praying right now, start by praying a little bit more. Make it tangible. Wallahi, you'll fall. If you're like, oh, you know what, from this moment I'm going to cut it all carbs. I'm not going to eat carbs. Sauce. Three, four days you're not going to eat it. After the fifth day you're going to bring this whole month stuff clean and you're going to eat the whole thing yourself. Oh, that's it, I'm going vegan. Three days you're not going to be like, no vegetarian, no meat for me. After the fourth day you're going to bring a cow and you're going to eat the entire cow. You have to make your Islam tangible and realistic. Wallahi, this is the best advice I ever learned in my life. The best advice I ever learned when it came to my religion is making it tangible, making it realistic, realistic. And pacing yourself. Allah doesn't want you to pray all night and never pray again. It's better that you keep this connection with Allah and improve slowly. I like to always keep this reminder every single time because it's so dear to me. You know, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. And we have to utilize what we have. Each other, our families, the masjid, the community. The best thing you can do for yourself is get involved in the community. Come to these programs. Anything, anything that's happening in your community, take your family to it. Make your family uh, attached to the masjid. Because you will design your life accordingly. And your kids may hate it and they start, oh, it's boring, why do you have to go to the masjid? I hate it. But they will become those children. There are certain children that every time you come to the masjid, you see the same families. You see the same kids running around. And you go, don't they have a life? Yes, they have a life. Their life is the masjid. And when those kids grow up, they're going to be attached to the concept of coming to the masjid. And they'll go out and they'll be faced by the challenges that life brings them, drugs, whatever it may be. Boyfriend, girl, and they'll go and they'll learn, but in the end of the day, they'll come back to where their heart is. And their heart is the message. Attach yourself with your community. I'm telling you, it's beautiful. Wallahi, it's beautiful. You know, this Friday, I, I, I love this community. I have a very special attachment to this community now. And Wallahi, I keep saying this, it's, it's not a joke. I'm telling you, I travel all over Canada and the US. Wallahi, I'm telling you, I travel all over Canada and the US. Every weekend I'm on a plane visiting somewhere else. And I see the communities and I go and every time I go to a masjid, I look at the, you know, what's going on, the activity boards, and, and, and I go into the masjid and I analyze the masjid. And I look at the people and I analyze the people. I look at the administration. This is what I do for a living. I love it. It's my passion. So when I come to this community, I talk about this masjid all over Canada and the US. A lot of us. A lot of my words. Every community I go to, I bring this masjid that I have. Wallah, you want to know why? Because it's something so small yet so big. After Friday, the brothers and sisters, if we don't know, this is something so dear to me. They sit down after Jum'ah prayer and they have little snacks and they sit down and they just talk. This is something that I think can change the Ummah. That can change the Ummah. Because why? We're bringing the community. And when you sit down and you do these things, every community I go to the same thing. I say, brothers, you know, after Jum'ah, you guys should do this. And people are establishing. And you have this here. I would move to this community to have this experience every Friday. From Jum'ah. And I love Jum'ah. But we have, if we're not here, we're not supporting these things, who will? You know, we talk about all these things increasing our faith. This is a part of it. Changing your life comes from you making the change. And remember, if you feel this emptiness of Allah, it's not because Allah moved it, it's because you. So, I hope these little steps we can apply in our life, take control of our life, because we have the ability to take control of our life. Get involved and, and, and do these little changes, inshallah. And I'll tell you, the best thing for your life is having Allah. It's the best thing you can do. And the moment you have Allah, you have everything. And the moment you don't have Allah, you have nothing. Live a life that's fulfilled with faith. A faith-centered life. And I guarantee you will be happy.
Because you know the one that's testing you has your back. And the moment you know that, no matter how hard he tests it, it becomes easy. SubhanAllah. So as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this community, I have a very special attachment to this community, and it's growing. And I have a very special attachment to the brothers and sisters everywhere, and especially here. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of you. JazakAllah khair for taking your time to come here. It means a lot to me, and the, you know, it means a lot to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to bless you, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy on you. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be prepared as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was prepared. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy so that we can deal with the situations when they come up. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it so that we can apply the, the skills that the Prophet has taught us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with the ability to understand that shaitan can only whisper to us and shaitan cannot change our state. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and allow us to sit down when we are angry and we are standing up. Make wudu when we are upset. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to smile in the face of anger. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to compromise. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to communicate with our spouses and the people that are in our life that cause us to get angry. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to take control when we are put into the situation of being able to abuse somebody else that we take charge of ourselves in that situation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can call out to all of us by name, by name on the Day of Judgment. And this is an honor inshallah, I think if we preserve and we stay true to some of these points that on the Day of Judgment, when Allah is calling you by name, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it inshallah. Jazakallah khair, is there any questions? I'll open the floor for some quick questions. I know we have to pray. We will pray inshallah. But are there any quick questions that we can attend to relative to the topic? If not, I think uh, we can pray inshallah. Perfect. I was hoping there was no questions. <laughs> <laughs> so Jazakallah khair, I really appreciate you guys coming today. Uh, Jazakallah khair for the brothers and sisters at uh, Mac for doing this. I, I always say the same thing. I have a very special attachment to Mac. Um, they're doing a lot of programs, and I encourage you to get involved in their programs and support this message. Sakala Khair to Ikana for inviting me over to Vancouver and allowing me to be a part of this. I know this program was a last minute thing, but again, I keep saying this that it doesn't, you have no idea how much it means to me for you all to come in here and, and learning a little I have because um, everything I learned, I learned from sitting in, in, from other people and absorbing from other people. But the most important thing is not the learning. The most important thing is the application. Anybody can know everything about Islam, but you applying it is the thing that changes the game. That's the thing that gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to apply what little we've learned. Uh, please stay after prayer and spend some time talking to each other, getting to know each other. There's faces here I haven't seen before. It's some faces that I would love to get to know more about you guys. So if we could sit down and chat for a little while and get to know each other. There are some very important things happening in this masjid. Brother Tariq and Sister, she's not here anymore. Breaks oh, yeah. my heart. <laughs> Breaks my heart every single time. But I know Sister Ida is here. I know I can provide her for me. Uh, Pronouncing her name, Ida, she corrected me. So now, Sister Ida, and maybe is there another brother or sister here that's here from back that we can uh, get to know, inshallah, and ask about the programs that are happening. Uh, brother Hamza is here today. If you don't know Brother Hamza, he has something called the Muslim Journal. Something very beautiful. Uh, he's a local to Vancouver. He's doing a lot of work, uh, traveling and talking to the Muslim youth. He's an excellent poet, and he's developed something called the Muslim Journal, and I talked about it last time. It's a journal that helps you track yourself daily with your prayer. It gives you some positive motivation every single day. It allows you to write some creativity. So I ask you all to meet with him, and it's something very cheap. It's like twenty dollars, twenty-three, thirty dollars US or something like that. Something very inexpensive, but once in a lifetime, once in a year investment that you make, and you can track your daily progress. And it allows you to track did you pray today? You know, some uh, positive points, something like that. Life, something beautiful, and it's a beautiful journal itself. And so, please spend some time getting to know him, uh, get to know your community, learn from your elders, inshallah, and get involved. JazakAllah uh, khairan. I really appreciate everything. I'm just going to take a quick video to share with... Um, I started to build my, uh, my Instagram, my social media, so uh, I'm going to do that right now. So, just keep talking and we'll go for, uh, we'll go for a prayer, inshallah, um, now. But if you want to follow me on anything, um, uh, the... Social, the Instagram.
friend that I have right now is the Muslim social worker. It's the Muslim social worker, and I'm going to start using that platform to putting out more content on my YouTube channel, inshallah. So um, please follow along. Zakallah uh, khair, and uh, thank you so much for coming, and let's pray, inshallah, for running late. Yeah. So, assalamu alaikum. These are all the people that showed up. Yeah.